on September 28th, 2004, Barbie released its fourth animated movie, which in my opinion is the best Barbie movie, Barbie as the Princess and the Popper. It is a lovely family-friendly musical. The songs are amazing and it is also the first time that we have Barbie appearing in a movie with brown hair. Yes, a brunette Barbie in a movie. I was so happy as a small child to have a Barbie that now looked like me and of course that Barbie was Erica and she was the popper in The Princess and the Popper. So we have Annalise who is of course the princess, the blonde one of the and then we also have Erica who is the popper who's also an indentured servant. At Madame, Madame, at Madame Carp's dressmakers and penitentiary. I presume that Erica is in about her 20s, early to mid 20s, and according to Madame Carp, she needs to work another 37 years to repay the debt that her parents took out to feed her. So in honor of the new Barbie movie coming out, I thought how fun would it be if I created one of my favorite characters' dresses from a Barbie movie, but in a more historically accurate way. Because while well, Barbie movies, they, are, they do not try to be historically accurate at all. They are a fun fantasy movie. They are historically inspired. Now, Barbie the Princess and the Popper is very much inspired by history. It is based on a historical fiction novel by Mark Twain. Mark Twain wrote The Prince and the Popper, and this was Mark Twain's first attempt at a historical fiction novel, and it was published in 1881, but it was set in 1547 in London, England. Twain's novel follows Prince Edward, son of Henry VIII, and a pauper boy named Tom Canty. These two boys, they look alike, they shame, <clears throat> they share the same birthday, and they get to know each other, they swap clothes, they assume each other's identities for a little while, and it's really about class struggle and class inequalities in Tudor England. Now, Barbie, Princess the, and the Pauper follows a very similar storyline with Princess Annalise and Princess Erica. They swap places and changing clothes. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's an interesting, well, I won't spoil the movie, even though it's like 20 years old. Now, it's hard to tell exactly when the Barbie movie is set. Uh, it's definitely not Tudor England, even though um, the Queen's outfits do look kind of Elizabethan slash Tudor in my opinion, but she's like the only one. What we're really going to go off of is Annalise's dress and Erica's dress, and they are like vaguely 1700s, even though the silhouette is very much more mid-Victorian, but we do have one saving grace in this movie for historical accurate fashions and that is Preminger. Preminger is the worst and also the best Barbie movie villain. So now if we look at Preminger's large but not exaggerated cuffs on his jacket, his longer waistcoat, and his moderately flared skirt on his jacket but not overly full, um, I believe that this would indicate that this movie is solidly set in the mid 1700s and therefore, I am going to base my dress in 1740 to 1760. Now, this is pre-industrial revolution. Trends are much slower. And especially since I am going to be making Erica's dress more of a work dress, it is the trends are going to change even slower over time. So we're going to assume that this is like a nice dress that she has made herself, but it is going to be very modest in uses, usage of fabric and decorations and trims because while I do believe that she would have access to some because she's a dressmaker, she could use whatever leftovers for herself, she still has very limited time and incredibly limited resources. Lucky. So to help me create my outfit from Barbie, Princess and the Popper historically accurate version, I have bought some things from Burnley and Trowbridge. So let's open this up. I don't think this is going to go very well. All right. 
We did it. <sighs> okay. So first things first, I needed a pattern for my bodice because uh, the way that I was just envisioning Erica's bodice is really B right here. So it has this lower peplum and then also has the stomacher here and that's just really what I think and that's just what I think the historically accurate version of her outfit needs to have like that flair that looks like the original design but also meets the standards of historical accuracy that I'm setting. This is a fine collection of 18th century jackets for un for undress wear by J.P. Ryan. J.P. Ryan patterns are amazing. If you have not checked them out, definitely do. Burnley and Trowbridge has some. You can also just order them from their um, J.P. Ryan's website. They're the same price. I checked because obviously, like, I wanted to check. Um, one of the reasons that I um, one of the reasons I ordered it from Burnley and Trowbridge though is because I also bought other things from them. So I I have always wanted one of the fishies, the like handkerchief things. Um, that brings, oh my gosh. I've always wanted one of these. One of their giant like fish shoes. So Erica has some floral designs on her dress and I wanted to incorporate floral designs but I didn't feel like the like jacket or the skirt needed to be that floral design but I needed like a little bit of floral design to carry it through. And this is perfect. Oh my gosh. I've always wanted one of these, and I just, I've never gotten myself one, until now. Oh my gosh. I'm so happy. This is so cool, Lucky. Yes. Yes. This is going to be perfect. So perfect. Lee, um, Burnley and Trowbridge ended up just releasing some new linens and one was what I thought the perfect color for the jacket that I'm going to be making. Okay. Oh. It's perfect. This is the perfect shade of blue for her dress. It is 100% linen. It has a beautiful weave on it. I got lucky. I didn't even order fabric swatches. I was just like, Burnley and Trowbridge is not going to fail me. All right, so we have the blue for the top part of the dress. And now I got a pink linen for the skirt. And I actually found 100% linen at Joann's. I had to order it online to get enough of it because my store did not have enough. Interesting. Okay. A good pink, a nice, a solid light pink. It feels bad. Like it's a, it's a coarser linen. Well, this side is, this side isn't. Maybe if I wash it, it'll be better, but I guess such is the life of an indentured servant. You, you don't get all the nice fabrics. So, so there are a lot of different YouTubers and costumers and uh, sewing people who are also making Barbie dresses because obviously the Barbie movie's coming out. It's been a huge deal with so much publicity. And uh, so therefore, make sure you go and like check everybody's out. I'm going to try to make a playlist where I like put everybody's places that I find as I find them and as they come out. But I really want to make sure that you go and check out Melissa of Hat to Hem because she's also making an Erica dress. And we've been like messaging back and forth about, um, you know, making these and encouraging each other. Uh, she's making one that is more cosplay based though. So if you're interested in that, be sure to definitely go check out Melissa of Hat to Hem. She's also just a delightful human being. Now it's time to get this project started. 
Step one is washing the fabric. Linen has an incredible tendency to shrink on the first wash, so if you buy linen that isn't pre-washed, you need to wash it before cutting out your pattern. Now linen can also be very bad about unraveling in the washer, so be sure to finish your ends. You can use a serger like I'm doing here, or you can do a hem. Just do something, or else you're going to end up with lots of little bits of linen in your washer. Trust me. Thankfully, the pink linen feels a lot better after washing it. Still not as nice, but a whole lot better. And it smells better too. It kind of smelled bad when it came out of the package. I will be making view B of this pattern. According to this pattern, view B has a long full skirt, open front, stomacher, and cuff sleeves, and therefore is an appropriate fashion for the 1760s. One, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. Ready or not, the sewing begins. Now, with all the pattern pieces that I needed to cut out, out, it was time to lay out the fabric. As I worked with this blue linen from Burnley and Trowbridge, the more I just fell in love with it. It is such a great fabric, and it was a little bit more expensive than I generally spend on fabric, but still reasonable. But because of that, because of how much I loved it and spent on it, I had some really bad first cut anxiety and I really had to stare at the fabric for a while and take some deep breaths before I was ready to make that first cut. But once I made that first cut, everything was okay and I was able to cut out the rest of the pattern with no incidents. To line the jacket, I had some natural linen, so some natural undyed linen, and I had gotten like two bolts of this for like $10 a bolt at a thrift store. Well, I didn't, my mom did. She's an amazing thrifter. She actually just found a Kit Kittredge American Girl doll for 12 bucks at a thrift store. I know, amazing, right? Anyway, the natural linen was perfect for a lining for this jacket. Okay, now I'm sure some of you are wondering why am I making a jacket and not a full gown because a gown would look a little bit more like Erica's that she wears in the movie. And well, one of the reasons that I'm making a jacket and not a full dress for Erica is because the fabric was rather expensive. And I personally did not want to spend that much money. And I also felt like this was more in the spirit of Erica's circumstances. I felt like she probably would have felt the same way as she is an indentured servant trying to pay back a debt therefore I went with a less expensive option of a jacket rather than a dress and I was also thinking if Erica is making her outfits out of leftover fabric there's probably not going to be a really big piece like a piece big enough for her to make a dress for herself so a jacket makes more sense since it's less fabric Yo-yo, I think the iron might be as big as you. That's actually kind of accurate. This is a rare occurrence that I have Lucky, my cat, and Yo-yo, my husband's cat, in the sewing room trying to supervise me at the same time. Lucky and Yo-Yo do not truly um, get along. And well, you'll, you'll see, you'll see in just a moment how that kind of plays out. This scene that you're about to see is a very common occurrence in our household. Why? 
one. No, 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 no. You're the only one having a problem right now. It's just you. This is a part. You are having a personal problem. Lucky just wants to be here too. You're welcome to be here, but you have to be nice. Can you be nice? Don't let her get you down, Lucky. I... Yo, yo. You're just being ridiculous. It's okay, Lucky. You have every right to be here just as much as she does. Yeah. I pinned all the pieces of the jacket together and I pinned all of the pieces of the lining together and then I sewed them with my sewing machine. Now is the sewing machine historically accurate for the 18th century? N no, it's not. Everything should have been hand sewn. I will be doing some hand sewing techniques throughout this video, but for a lot of the seams that are on the inside that no one will truly ever see except for you, dear subscriber, I'm using the machine. I'm also not using completely historically accurate construction methods. I just didn't have time for that and I don't understand it quite honestly. Um, I'll get there at some point. So the pattern said to have a 5'8 seam allowance and I thought, oh, that means that is really small. Um, not necessarily. Um, I actually had to go back and, and redo it and I should have just you know used the ruler that's on my sewing machine. Uh, but I didn't quite and then I think even though I thought I was making it to my measurements oh lucky you're so cute you're so cute um, I thought I was making it to my measurements it's actually like a little big because here let's try it on see it, it still almost meets in the middle and around my waist, I can kind of like really make that uh, come together. I do really like how the back looks, like the little peplum back here. But I do think I need to take it in even more on all of the seams. Because um, otherwise, because it, it needs to be like here. And if it's open here, then this is kind of, this isn't floppy. Like, this is kind of floppy. And I want it to be more fitted. Erica is a good seamstress. She does good work. Let me see. I need to pin the shoulders to try this on. I did not sew the shoulders down yet. So this one I did a little bit better on because I learned from my mistake with this one, um, I, I learned I needed to take it in a little bit more um, when I was sewing, or you know, do the correct seam allowance. Because so this one actually feels okay. Um, it still gets in like a little close, but like I kind of like it how it's closer down here um, than it is up there. So this one actually feels pretty good. I might take it in a little bit more because this is pretty close. And I want it to be a little bit more here. But I don't think I'm going to have to do as much adjusting as I am uh, on the other piece. I took the jacket and the lining in just a little bit more because I wanted to be able to show off the stomacher and the jacket was still overlapping too much. It didn't have enough gap between the two edges for it the stomacher to really show so so once I thought it was good after taking it in 
um, I went ahead and I attached the outer fabric, the blue fabric, to the lining fabric. And I just sewed all the way around, leaving the front edges open so that I could turn the jacket right side out. Again, this is not a historically accurate construction method. The way that I should have actually done it was construct the lining actually how I did, but then I would piece the blue fabric onto the lining almost like how I'm about to do the facings. Um, I've never constructed a dress like that before, but I hope to one day, once I have just a little bit more experience and maybe a class on how to do that. The jacket also had facings that I cut out and sewed onto the front edge of the jacket, and then I ironed those facings down. And then I folded the raw edge under to make it nice and clean. And then I used a hem stitch to sew the facing to the lining. A hem stitch is used to finish raw edges. It is not just used on the bottom hem of gowns. Now to do a hem stitch, you travel with your needle parallel to what you're hemming. And you take just a little bite of the fabric behind the hem, behind the fold. So in this case, that's my lining fabric. And then I just go right from that little bite and then I take another little bite out of the fold or the hem and then I pull it through and just do it again. Now here I am only taking a little bite of the lining fabric. I'm being really careful so it doesn't show on the outside of my garment because I don't want it to show. It was then time to insert the sleeves into the jacket, but of course to do that, I first had to construct the sleeves. I sewed the sleeves and the lining for the sleeves, and then I sewed the sleeves and the lining to the sleeves together, turned those right side out, and inserted them into the jacket. They did not fit perfectly smoothly. I had to do little tucks or like pleats up on the top of the shoulders, but Sleeves are hard to fit, and sometimes I like having a little bit more room up top because it's easier to move that way. I then constructed the cuffs for the sleeves. Cuffs are one of the hallmarks of early to mid 1700 fashions. Now cuffs, they go out of style for ladies in the later 1700s. So this is one way that I can try to date and identify garments. Um, now this doesn't always work because sometimes you, it was pretty easy to just take off the cuff and redo the little ends of the sleeve to make your dress look more fashionable. So it's not a sure thing to, to date a dress with, but it is one way that you can kind of, you know, file in your mind to help you date dresses when you're looking at them. I attach the cuffs by hand. I thought this was going to be an easier method and then, you know, not have a line of machine stitching, machine stitching showing somewhere. And while I did not attach them in the most pretty of method, it did work. Oh, lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's fun. Okay. So the jacket is basically done, and I've been, of course, trying it on a little bit every time I, you know, finish a part of it. And I'm concerned that it might be a little tight in the back when I like go to move my arms. It feels like a little bit constricting. Um, but I have not actually tried it on with my stays, and of course, stays cause especially. Uh, Stays make your body move in different ways because, of course, you are wearing this very nice structured garment that is going to make it to where you're holding yourself differently than modern, per se. Now, I am wearing, like, modern clothes under it instead of my shift. I think that'll be basically the same idea. Um, but I do think that, it, of course, is going to fit better over stays as this pattern is designed to fit over stays. So let's try it on. And that's as I expected. I it, it's a little tight, like right here, but I hardly notice it when I have my stays on. So I'm very glad that it's just.
just a, of course you just gotta wear your right undergarment situation. Uh, versus a, oh no, what have I done? Because I, I can still do all my movements. I can signal a plane to land, as every good girl in the 18th century has to do. And of course, my cat is so excited. I have a string attached to myself, and she's like, this, this is the best day. Yes. It's a toy. There you go. Okay. So yeah, little, little tight, but also like, to be, ex it fits well. It, it's not a, it, I, I barely feel it with the, the actual stays on, so very happy about that. I just have to add nice little buttons up the front of this. I use these pretty cloth covered white buttons to sew onto the front of the jacket. This is what the pattern called for. And so far, J.P. Ryan, I mean, I, I think they're fairly historically accurate. So I'm going to try the buttons and if I hate it or find out it's not historically accurate, then I'll go back and I'll hand sew eyelets. But now with the jacket done, it is time to move on to the stomacher. I cut two layers of my lining fabric out, that natural linen, and then I cut one pattern piece of the stomacher out of the nice white linen that I had, or it might be a linen blend. But I then took that top piece of the stomacher and I put it into my embroidery machine. I, you know, loaded it up into the embroidery hoop, put it into the machine, and then I designed the best I could with my preset designs what I have seen 18th century stomachers look like. So it took several different designs, layering them to make them look 18th century, but I, I think I did a really good job. Now I have a very important question. What song is the best song in Barbie Princess and the Popper? There are so many wonderful songs. They are all wonderful. I, I understand that. I love them. But I do feel like everyone really likes the, the song, I'm a girl like you. And I mean, I do understand that's kind of the whole premise of the plot. But I think the best song is If You Loved Me For Me. I love that song. I think it has this wonderful heart message longing of just wanting to be loved for yourself and just wanting to, to, to be loved for yourself, to, to have someone love you just for being you and not for something that you have to pretend to be. So let me know what your favorite song is down in the comments and your thoughts on that. Now, I'm not sure if you could tell by this entire video, but I am a huge fan of Barbie Princess and the Popper. I do believe that it is the best Barbie movie. I even had a my size Barbie version of Barbie Princess and the Popper, but it's really fun because the Erica one, it, it, you didn't actually get a brown haired Barbie. It came with a wig, so you could like make her both. It was then time to add boning to the stomacher. So I took my two pieces of lining fabric, that, that natural linen, and I marked where the boning channels needed to go. And I then sewed those boning channels and I began to insert the boning. I used just some regular plastic boning I had in my stash and I of course made sure to round out the edges so I didn't get poked. So as I was trying to smooth out the boning and I was using my scissors to do that, I uh, cut my knuckle. And um, I have now definitely put my blood, sweat, and tears into this project. It was then time to attach the embroidered fabric to the lining fabric. I basically just sandwiched these together, took the edge of the embroidered fabric and bent it over all of the lining fabric and then I used a whip stitch to secure the fabrics together. Now it's time for the last piece of this outfit, which is the pink petticoat with that pink linen that I got from Joanne's Fabrics. And yes, I am calling this a petticoat, um, even though it is a skirt that you are going to be seeing. And that is because the term petticoat is the correct term for a woman's 
garment that attaches at the waist and goes to the floor. Today we would call this a skirt, but up until the 19th century, you would call this garment a petticoat, whether it was worn on top or under an, another petticoat. You know, I'm wearing an under petticoat and an over petticoat. Um, that's just that's just the word for it. I do not have a pattern for this. I am taking my measurements from my waist to the floor. I do that by standing on the measuring tape and then seeing what number I come up with. And that is almost always 42. I have not grown in the past several years. So 42 is, is probably going to be my measurement from waist to floor for a while. But I need that measurement, my waist measurement, and then I can go to work making a petticoat. It's pretty easy. There's a couple videos online. Burnley and Trowbridge has a lovely video about how to make a petticoat that I used as reference as well as my American Duchess guide to 18th century dressmaking. They also have instructions on how to make a petticoat in there. My linen was 60 inches wide, so basically I didn't have to do anything to the width. I just had to cut out two 60 by 42 inch rectangles, and then I went to pleat the top. You pleat the front of the petticoat with a box pleat in the middle and then you follow the directions of that box pleat out to the sides of your fabric and for the back of your petticoat you box pleat but you invert it so it's going in and then you knife pleat going again following the directions of that box pleat. Of course, you're going to need to sew those two rectangles of the front and the back of your petticoat together, but you're going to leave a gap of about 10 inches on the side because those are your side openings. That's how you're going to be able to get into the petticoat. And also you're going to need those slits because how else are you going to get into your pockets? You need those pocket slits. It was then time to attach the waist tapes to the tops of the petticoats. That's also going to act as the ties. So I have this wonderful tape that my uncle had sent me. I don't really know what it is, but it's wonderful and I thought it would work perfect for this. I hem stitched, again, hem stitching. It's a great stitch. I hem stitched the front of the tape to the front of the fabric and then I folded it over and hem stitched it along the back as well. And then I also needed to, well, do the hem. And of course, I did a hem stitch for that. I folded the hem over twice, trying to make the hem very small as 18th century hems are. And then I was done. I am so proud of how this project turned out. I really feel like I completed my mission of making a historically accurate Erica cosplay from Barbie Princess and the Popper. I absolutely, I, I love it. I hope y'all had a really great time coming along on this really fun adventure with me. I am going to be doing another video about how I got dressed as Erica so you can see how all the pieces come together. But yeah, thanks so much for coming along and subscribe if you want to be part of the Historical Bell Society.